Okay, the title of this particular message is Once Saved, God Optional. No, I'm not saying that God is thrown out of the life of the believer with this doctrine, but I do want to stress one point, that once a person is saved, why do you even need God? Maybe for prayer, if you need a job or different circumstances. But in reality, you can live your life and totally forget about God, and still you are saved. So on the subject of eternal security, it is the belief that once a person has received the free gift of salvation, from that moment on, they are eternally saved. There is nothing they can do to lose their salvation. This would be great, but is it scriptural? In this study, I will cover most of the major points on once saved, always saved, and refute them. This study is long, but it covers most of what the debate is all about. At the end, I will cover the two Hebrew passages that all Christians have a hard time with. Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10. I have also included a poem that I have written on this message. So what is salvation? In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve enjoyed unbroken fellowship with their Creator. However, right from the beginning, God warned them that their fellowship with Him was conditional. If fellowship with God was conditional then, what evidence can one give to prove that there has been a change? Notice the conditionary theme between man and God throughout the scriptures. When we look at the beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, notice in verse 17, it says, For in the day that thou eateth thereof, thou shall surely die. Notice there was an action that could break fellowship with God. Dr. Stanley states from his book, Eternal Security, Can You Be Sure? Quote, if there is a condition, even one, attached to God's willingness to maintain a relationship with his children, it is not unconditional, end quote. Little did he know that he would actually help me but we have come to totally different conclusions. All I have to do is give one, and I give more, condition to prove his belief wrong. Quote, Can we pledge unconditional loyalty to a God who promises only conditional loyalty in return? End quote. That was clearly the case with Adam in the scriptures I have just quoted. As we go throughout the Old Testament, look at Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Again, when a righteous man doeth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thy hand. Again, a clear theme is shown that salvation is conditional. Notice there is a turning and an act to commit iniquity that will result in his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. Going into the New Testament. Notice that we are compared to branches. To me, this is one of the best examples of the life of the believer. For if someone found a person lost in the forest and then rescued them, gave them a great meal, would that be enough to take care and sustain them for a lifetime? I think not. That is why the just shall live by faith. What we clearly see in the following verses is this. We must remain in Christ. That is where our life and our security lie. 
Again, an action of not abiding is one of the ways in which the believer dies spiritually, and thus salvation is conditional. John chapter 15 verses 5 through 6 state the following, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And the men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. On the second part, the second verse, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. That is implying that he was at one point abiding, and then is cast forth. We must abide in him, and if not, we will wither and die. Having said this, let us go to the Roman passage. Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 18. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt then say, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. First, we are not to boast against the branches, which is speaking of the children of Israel. The Apostle Paul reminds the Romans that it is the root, meaning God, that bears them and not the other way around. It was unbelief that the branches were broken off so that we might be grafted in. The Apostle Paul proves the conditionary clause to the nation of Israel by stating because of unbelief they were cut off. However, this is what people miss. In verse 20 it states, Thou standest by faith, but then the last part blows away, once saved, always saved. Be not high-minded, but fear. So why would a believer be told from the Apostle Paul to fear if they cannot lose their salvation? This cannot refer to the judgment seat of Christ as some have thought. At that judgment, every believer will know that they made it since most, if not all of them, have already been with the Lord. And it is before the great white throne judgment. Even if all one's works were to be burnt up, they still have eternal life. Why would someone fear if they might get some rewards? It is so unfortunate what Dr. Stanley says about the judgment seat of Christ. Quote, at the judgment seat of Christ and see our works burned to ashes would be a much severer punishment than death. Hebrews 10.29 for believers who live for themselves with little or no thought for the things of God, it will certainly be a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. End quote. My take is a lot different. Look at these two references. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said the following, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 12, 5, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Folks, how is burning in hell the same as one's work being burned to ashes? How can someone even use the word terrifying if you might get a reward? To be cast into hell, yeah, that's pretty terrifying. But your work's burned to ashes, it's not on the same level. The main audience that the Apostle Paul wrote to were believers. Why are we told by both Jesus and the Apostle Paul to fear if once saved, always saved is true? So the Apostle Paul states, Thou standest by faith, 
of Dr. Stanley states, The doctrine of eternal security is supported by the belief that God is so infinitely holy and good that there is nothing, not one thing we can do to obtain or maintain our salvation. End quote. Romans 11.21 says, For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee. So God's track record in the Old Testament was that the natural branches he did not spare. Why would the Apostle Paul state, take heed lest he spare not thee, if it is impossible for a Christian to lose one's salvation? Verse 22, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. But toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Clearly the Apostle Paul states a condition, which if thou continue in his goodness, however the same fate awaits the New Testament believer if they don't. Otherwise thou shall be cut off. Don't forget this scripture, Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So from the beginning and throughout the Old Testament, and it clearly continues in the New Testament, the theme of conditional security. Think of it this way. One may activate a security system, whether on a house, a car, a computer, etc. Yet if one never updates or renews the contract, then one day you will be at risk. So let us go back to the beginning to understand the subject of salvation from a proper perspective. After Adam's sin, his fellowship with God was severed, like getting a computer virus. Since God's standard was so high, there was nothing man could do to restore his relationship with God. Since God's law was violated, there was a punishment that was handed out, which was death. Death in the scriptures speak of separation. Adam sinned and passed on sin to the rest of of the human race like a virus that spreads thus we have all sinned from the moment of conception since Adam's spiritual virus has been passed on to us we have all the death sins as a result of his sin so the only solution was for God to provide what is called salvation so what is the definition of salvation it means to be delivered from the penalty of eternal death, and to be restored in fellowship with our Creator. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, and thus His blood was pure. When we apply His blood to our lives, we are restoring our spiritual DNA back to its original state and virus-free. It's like a restored point on a computer. One can choose to accept or reject God's gift of salvation. For this message, I have read Dr. Stanley's book, Eternal Security, You Can Be Sure. I want to share some of his key thoughts from the book. Some others do add an additional point that if one lives like the devil, they were never saved to begin with. Their reasoning is this. They believe that when a believer is first converted, from that moment on, there should be fruit to show their conversion. And I agree. But let me make it clear. Just as a tree that used to bear fruit, it can become disease and it can no longer bear fruit or it may bear bad fruit. Though it's possible that some could totally not receive salvation correctly or not at all, it is a stretch to say that this premise applies to anyone that claims to be a Christian and lives like the devil. God's word states, if one confesses with the mouth the Lord Jesus and believes in their heart,
that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If God says one is to believe and confess and one is saved, then who are we to say otherwise? Either his word works or it doesn't. Here are the three main points I will cover in this message and refute. Quote, no sin, no matter how great or frequent, can affect one's salvation. Second, no unbelief after one is saved can affect one's salvation. Third, no conscious decision to walk away can invalidate their salvation. Those three points I will cover in detail. However, there are about a dozen or so other points I want to quickly refute first. I will also cover some other points in detail as needed. Here's the first one. There is nothing, not one thing we can do to obtain or maintain our salvation. This is just blatantly false. Question, did you do anything to become a Christian? Or did you just know that you were saved? I mean, were you waiting in line in Walmart and then bam, you realized you were saved? No way. Because the way one is to obtain salvation was by believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. In faith, you did that. And the action that you did was you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Here's another one. No one can pluck a believer out of God's hand. However, a believer can simply walk away and God himself can pluck a person out. Psalms 52 5 says this, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. There's another one. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I couldn't agree more. God's love will remain to each individual to the gates of hell. Remember the scripture says, for God so loved the world. We can't separate God's love toward the world, but it's our sin that separates our fellowship with God. And because of that, when that fellowship is separated, the final separation is hell. Even Jesus on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And yet many of them will stand before him and be sent to hell. Here's another one. We are his body. He cannot deny himself. Again, go back to the Roman passages because we are the branches. And remember, we are not to boast because God is the one that bears us, not the other way around. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. You stand by faith, not a one-time experience. Remember, once one is cast as a branch, it withers and dies. That is why we need to abide in him. A branch is part of a vine as we are part of his body. Notice that a branch can be broken off just as we can too. Next, we are saved as by fire. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3.13. Now, some believers will be saved as by fire as seen in 1 Corinthians 3.13. At this judgment, all our works are kind of thrown in a big pile. It's lit up, and whatever remains are the rewards that we receive. If there's nothing there, we are still saved, but as by fire. However, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30, Jesus is telling us that we need to take extreme measures in order that we don't sin and end up in hell. It says, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body 
should be cast into hell. And he repeats it with the hand. Now, what I want to bring out is this. If the unrighteous that never accept Jesus were to fulfill the command of the Matthew passage, will they make it in? No, because the only the work of the cross could take the place for our sin. So tell me, why in the world did Jesus say this? If it does not apply to Christians, if it doesn't apply to Christians, then who does it apply to? So the believer and the non-believer will deal with fire. Now the believer's work will be tested that way, and whatsoever is left is a reward. Unfortunately, the non-believer's sins will be punished by fire. Question is, which fire will be at your judgment? One point I want to bring out, it is from my understanding, and this is what I believe what once saved always people believe. So if this is not the case, please let me know. That those that believe in once saved always saved believe that the children of Israel under the law of Moses were also once saved always saved. Thus, even if someone was stoned to death for a capital offense, they still made it in and they would be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. So, let's think of a believer in the Old Testament who was stoned to death for adultery. This guy was a real knucklehead. And at the judgment seat of Christ, all his works would be burned up and he will still be saved yet as by fire. Now, to be stoned to death was a terrible way to go, but at least he has eternal life. If that is true, consider a New Testament believer that not only was an adulterer, but he totally walked away from Christ. In fact, he mocked him for years before he died. Now, according to one saved, always saved, he would be saved also, yet as by fire. What does one think of the following scripture? He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, verse 29. Of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who has trodden under the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite or in the Greek insult unto the spirit of grace. If it is a worse punishment for the New Testament believer, then how could that be since both were saved yet as by fire? The Old Testament believer was stoned to death but we don't see that happening in the New Testament. So how can the New Testament believer have a punishment that's worse? If a believer could lose their salvation, then this passage could be fulfilled. Next, how can we become guilty after God has declared us not guilty? Simple. We do something that makes us guilty again. Folks, don't you remember what happened with OJ? He was acquitted and later he was arrested. Now, I confess that God has cleansed me from sin and I'm thankful for it. However, I still struggle with sin like anyone else. Even though I have become white as snow, I still can become guilty again. Matthew 5.28, this is a little different translation, but it really illustrates my point. Matthew 5.28 says, But I will tell you that whosoever looks at a woman and cherishes lustful thoughts has already in his heart become guilty with regard to her. Most men are honest. will agree that we can become guilty again. I do not believe that one that struggles with this or any sin sends a person to hell. I do believe in the carefree attitude of the once saved, always saved is dangerous that can cause a person to lose their salvation. Matthew chapter 18 verses 23 through 35 
speaks of forgiveness and debt. Notice one that owed a lot of debt was forgiven. He then goes to someone who owed him a little and demands it all. Notice the debt that was canceled was reinstated. So how can one become guilty again? At full at first. Verse 26 and 27. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. However, since he did not have compassion on someone that owed him a small amount, notice what happened next. Verse 32. Then his Lord, after he had called them, and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desireth me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on my fellow servant, even as I have on pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. The man that was forgiven of his debt became in debt again. So with a lustful look, he can become guilty again. Next, how can one become unadopted? Well, simply ask Judas. Acts chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Now, I do want to bring out one point about Judas. There's a lot of debate concerning Judas. Was he saved or not? Only thing I want to mention is this. From the scriptures we see, it's those that are born again are able to cast out devils. Notice that Jesus stated when the Pharisees accused him of casting out devils by Beelzebub, he stated, I by Beelzebub cast out devils. Whom do your children cast them out? And if Satan cast out Satan, how shall his kingdom stand? So the only point I want to bring out is this. How could Judas cast out devils by Beelzebub? Because the only way you cast out devils is by the Spirit of God. That's why I firmly believe that he was a believer at one time. But it's not necessarily a big topic for me because there's so much more that we can go throughout the scriptures and see that salvation is, is conditional. Next, once a son, always a son. Luke 15, 32 states, it was meet that we should make merry. Be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Notice the father declared that his son was dead, but now alive. Yet he was physically alive the whole time, but not spiritually. So it is with us. God the Father desires to reinstate us, but until we repent, we are dead in our sins, though we are alive. Next point, we are adopted on a probation until we die. This is what I believe, and this is why. I want to bring attention to the way Jesus considered adoption. It was not a once a son, always son, but I believe that it was with the catch from what we find in Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. As he was talking, someone came up to him and says, Look, behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. And then he responds, But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? He stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. He also speaks of this concept in another passage. Matthew 7, 21. 
Not everyone that, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now let's go to the meaning of a gift. Picture, here is something we experience every time we are handed a gift. It refers to the entire process Paul has just finished describing. That is salvation. Salvation, Paul says, is a gift. Now, I don't know about you, but I have learned that a gift that can be taken back is no gift. Thus, gifts have no strings attached. Once you place a condition of any kind on a gift, it becomes a trade, not a gift. Therefore, placing conditions on salvation is equivalent of not believing Ephesians 2 8 or John 4 10 or other passages where salvation clearly described as a gift what we do with the gift is another matter entirely the fact that I don't take advantage of a gift says nothing about who it belongs to it still belongs to me. You can take a gift and bury it in the backyard, but it's still yours. Once you accept a gift, you are stuck with it, like it or not. But you say, what if I give it back? You can give it back only if the giver accepts the return. In this case, salvation, God has a strict no return policy, end quote. I want you to consider, was not Adam given the gift of life? Did God place any conditions on him? Certainly so. We read that earlier in Genesis chapter 2. Quote, what do we do with the gift is another matter entirely. I agree, end quote. That is the point. A gift can be ruined. How? Remember, Jesus spoke that he is the vine we are the branches. If we abide not, we are cast as a branch and we are withered and thus the gift is ruined. Next section, name to blot out. In Revelation 3, 5, Jesus said, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Why is this important? Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 states the following, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is the problem. According to once saved, always saved. Those that are unbelievers will never have their names written in the book of life. Those that are saved will. However, some believe that the list was completed before the foundation of the world, both of the saved and unsaved. Thus, they believe that God does not have an eraser. But if God enter names, and here's the quote from Dr. Stanley, according to his foreknowledge, which makes no sense at all, if God wrote an erase according to his foreknowledge, both his writing and his erasing would be complete before the world began, end quote. Well, I want to present two verses that I believe that will contradict his view because his premise of why would God bother writing something and then blotting it out because it doesn't make sense. Well, I want you to consider these following scriptures. Isaiah chapter 44 Verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So in Isaiah, we clearly see that sins must have been recorded at some time, and then God erased them. So if we use his premise, why bother recording them? If he was going to blot them out anyway, it appears that God has already gone against his premise. 
Acts chapter 3 verse 19 states the following, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It seems to me that the Apostle Peter is stating, If you repent, your sins can be blotted out. To me, that's implying a future tense. Either way, God does have an eraser. Now, since God ultimately knows who will be saved and who will not, then Revelation 3.5 should be of no concern for the believer, according to Dr. Stanley. There are two other places that speak of a book that either the righteous or the unrighteous may be blotted out. First is Exodus chapter 32. This is dealing with Moses. In verse 30, it states, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go unto the Lord. Preadventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. This is quite interesting because we sin all the time. And yet Moses was concerned about this sin. That's why this is important, folks. Because all sin is not treated equally, as some may have supposed. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Now forgive them of this sin. And if you will not forgive them, then erase my name from your book. But the Lord said to Moses, Only the people I erase from my book are those who sin against me. According to Dr. Stanley, Moses was not referring to the book of life, but to their natural life. The Lord did respond to Moses and said that those that sin he would blot out of my book. Dr. Stanley believes that Moses is in no way referring to the book of life, since that would mean that Moses was willing to go to hell for the children of Israel. However, that actually is a possibility, though it may not seem likely, but we do find that the Apostle Paul was willing to do such a thing. Romans chapter 9 verse 3 states the following, for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. However, I don't think one could say for certain that this book is the book of life. Since the Bible records more than one book, Dr. Stanley does give a list of some of the other books that are found in the Psalms. Psalms 87 6, Psalms 56 8, Psalms 139 15 through 16. But let's look at another example which concerns that of David. Psalms chapter 69 is where we'll begin. Let's look at verse 27. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Though this passage is speaking of David, of David's enemies, he finally gets to the point in which Dr. Stanley believes he was asking God to take them out. According to Dr. Stanley, he's not asking them to go to hell, but simply to take out their physical life. I want to show you some other translations that may contradict the very thing that he believes. In verse 27 from the New King James, add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Basically, David is asking that their sins will continue to pile up and they will not get saved. Here are a few more translations that confirm that. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. Give punishment for their iniquity, and they enter not into their righteous. 
in the next verse, I believe there are two books spoken of. It begins by stating this, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. With that understanding, it's most likely possible that this was the first book in which someone's physical life may or may not be blotted out. Whether this refers to Moses, I don't think either way we can say for certain. But a person's life may be taken out because of sin. Now, even though I firmly believe that one can lose their salvation, I do believe that sometimes the Lord will bring a person home before they lose their salvation. We find that the Apostle Paul, in dealing with sin, it was not with the sword, but what did he do? He delivered a person that was sleeping with his stepmother unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved. However, the man did repent and we see that he was reinstated into the household of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. So a person's name may be blotted out of the book of the living, but the next part may be referring to the book of life. To me, that David is asking not only for God to physically take out his enemies, but that their names be not written in the book of life. Now let's continue to the New Testament. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, the Apostle Paul mentions some fellow laborers in the gospel whose names were written in the book of life. Jesus also told some of his disciples not to rejoice that the devils were subject unto them, but that their names were written in heaven. Now, according to Dr. Stanley, people are just reading too much into Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, where it states, And I will not blot out his name, out of the book of life. According to Dr. Stanley, God does not have an eraser. He does mention that this verse was never intended to be a warning. And there's nothing really negative about these words. The point that Dr. Stanley makes is that all entries into the book of life were completed before any of us were born. In fact, as support, he mentions Revelation 13, 8 and Revelation 17, 8, which basically say the same thing, whose names were not in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Then at the great white throne judgment, which is believed to happen after the believer's judgment, all those whose names are not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. Reference is Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 through 15. Now, only the righteous whose names are written in the book of life will enter into the holy city. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. However, why would Jesus mention, and I will not blot out his name, out of the book of life. Dr. Stanley does not really properly address this. He kind of pushes it under the rug. But I believe that the last two passages can really bring this together. In the book of Revelation, let's look at chapter 22, verse 19. It states this, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So let's break this down. If any man, well, that could refer to saved or unsaved, shall take away. In the Greek, that means removed. Here's the action. The action is from the words of the book of this prophecy. What will be the result? God shall take away, or God shall remove. What shall he remove? Two things. But notice what it says, his part. The word part there in the Greek means share, section, or allotment. 
and there's two things that are taken out that apply to this particular example out of the book of life and out of the holy city i'm not sure what it means and from the things which are written in this book i don't have understanding on that we have already seen that whosoever's name was not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire and does not have eternal life Rome, that's in revelation 2015 if your name is not found in the book of life, you cannot enter the holy city. Revelation 21, 27. Now, suppose there was a father that was rich, and was about to die. His kids were to inherit each a part, a share, or an allotment of his money. And they would be allowed to live in his mansion for free. However, he clearly tells his kids that no one is to reveal how he came up with his inventions. If one of his kids were to disclose it, they would have their part taken out of the money and would not be allowed to live in the mansion. Now consider that God desires that his kids will have eternal life and they can live in the holy city for free. With that in mind, let us consider the passage one more time. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, both the saved and unsaved could take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. However, the next part can only apply to the saved. Listen closely. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city just as only the rich dad's kids could lose their inheritance and a chance to live in the mansion for free only the save could lose by having their name blotted out of the book of life and only them could lose not being able to live in the holy city you can't have your name taken out of the book of life if it was never there to begin with. So this passage destroys once saved, always saved. Now, some may say, well, if one's name may be written in the book of life only to be erased, then it doesn't make sense. Wouldn't God not just bother to put their name down and then do so and then erase it? Though I have already mentioned the blotting out of our sins, I want you to consider something else. First, let me give an illustration, and then I'm going to talk about Abraham to prove my point. If you and I were in a helicopter high above in the sky, and we're watching a car racing on a very curvy road in the mountains, the driver of the car may not see that a tractor trailer had lost its brakes and was out of control. However, from the helicopter, we can clearly see that the driver in the race car will meet with certain death as he goes around the next corner. You and I are not the reason for the fatal accident. We would, however, be able to see it ahead of time. For the Godhead knew that before the foundation of the world, that Jesus would have to die on the cross for our sins. However, when Jesus was on the cross, notice he had a personal experience. He experienced the separation from his father for our sins. There's a difference between knowing something and knowing by experience. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This happened in a certain time in history, and there he actually felt the separation. It was not just a knowing of a separation. There's a big difference. In Abraham, we see that God knew what Abraham would do. When God had asked Abraham to offer his son, God's purpose was not that he would kill his son, God's not into child sacrifice, but he wanted to see where Abraham stood. Now, God 
would know what he would do, but God wanted an experience in order for Abraham to understand how powerful he was. And notice that when Abraham was ready to slay his son, the angel stopped him and says, For now I know thou feareth God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. God really wasn't nervous what Abraham would be willing or not to do. But for now I know was the experience. So what in the world does this have to do with the book of life? God decides to do things his way. So God knows things ahead of time. But he does things that don't make sense to us until the event happens. Notice that whosoever's name was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God did not have to go through all the trouble to look for someone that he knows that their name is not there at all. But yet he does. However, the great white throne judgment he will know by experience those that he has created, yet those that have rejected him. I believe he does this to show to the lost how dreadful their state really is, that they may have a full impact by experience of how lost they are. Think about it. If it was said to you, that your name is not found in the book of life. It is one thing to be cast into hell. It is another thing for your name to be searched and search and come up empty and then be cast into hell. On the other hand, notice Jesus will personally confess a person's name before the Father. Does Jesus have to personally confess a person's name that he knows is in the book of life? No. Instead, think of the eternal impact that will have on a person. I believe that God knows who will come to him in salvation. However, I also believe that God also knows who will ruin the gift of salvation. Psalms 9, chapter 9, verse 5 says, Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put their name out forever and ever. See, folks, notice thou hast put out their name forever and ever. Those that are not found in the book of life will become forgotten in hell. I know many will still believe in once saved, always saved, no matter what I present. But if there's a chance that some may escape hell, it would be worth it. So, there are clear references to the wicked not having their names written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. But is there one clear reference showing the timing of the righteous names being written from the foundation of the world? I have not found that. There's references concerning being chosen from that point, but nothing about their names being written. The reason why I believe that is so is because, look, let's go back to what we're talking about here. When Jesus said, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, I believe in order for him to say that, that person's name was in the the book of life and it was a promise if you do what i say you will not lose your salvation and i think it's very possible that the time that the person's name is written in the book of life is at conversion because do not the angels rejoice when a sinner repents they rejoice in heaven why do they only rejoice at that moment if their name is not written at that moment. If their name is always written, why rejoice at that moment? So I believe that the whole reason that we can look at the passage in Revelation 3, 5 makes perfect sense. For the righteous, I believe, 
that their names are written not from the foundation of the world, but at conversion. I can't say for sure, but it seems to make the most sense. And because we already see that God does have an eraser, be careful that your name is not erased from the book of life. So now let's look at the seal of God. Basically, the belief is simple. Since a believer is sealed by the Holy Spirit, nothing can tamper with it, and thus they are once saved, always saved. There's nothing that can be done to break the seal. Here are the two references on the matter. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20-22. through 22. In verse 22, it states, Who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The other reference is Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The actual definition, according to Strong's, when speaking of the seal, is to stamp with a signet or private mark for security. To me, this simply means a mark that we are the property of the Holy Spirit. The fallacy that I see is this. To say that a seal cannot be broken is to claim something that is not a reality. Think of seals that we use. If you buy a jar of peanut butter, it has a seal on it. It protects it from contamination from the outside. However, it is meant to be broken. Who can eat peanut butter if the seal is not broken? We have seals for bags of potato chips. There are big trucks that will have a seal at the back door so only the right person can open it. So the seal is used to protect what is inside until the right person gets it. So seals are meant to be broken. One may say, but the seal of the believer is designed to preserve the believer unto the day of redemption. Sure, but there is a problem. The believer himself can be the problem. In chapter 4, the Apostle Paul clearly speaks of the believer being sealed unto the day of redemption. Thus, over and over, the once saved always crowd will declare that the seal cannot be broken, and they will inherit the kingdom of God. However, in the very same letter, in the very next chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, the Apostle Paul goes through great lengths to say that those that practice certain sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's important because it shows that sin can break the seal. In fact, one thing I want to bring out is this. Jesus himself spoke of something that could apply to this very subject. Because most of us, when we look at the sealed unto the day of redemption, it seals contamination from the outside. But have anyone ever considered, is it possible to have contamination from the inside, which is the heart. In fact, doesn't the scripture say that the heart is deceitfully wicked? Who can know it? But in Mark chapter 7, verses 19 through 23, Jesus responds to a question concerning the disciples, why they did not wash their hands before they ate. Not a cleanliness issue, but a certain way of washing that the Jews came up with that had nothing to do with cleanliness, but a simple tradition that they demanded that his disciples would follow. Because they thought if they did not do this, it would defile the man. Yet Jesus says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts. And he went on to say, that's what defiles the man. Now think of it. It's not the contamination on the outside, but from the inside. And we're, what is the inside? It's the heart. It's the heart that can become 
contaminate and could affect the seal. That's why David prayed, creating me a clean heart. There's another point I want to bring out. If you want to say that the seal cannot be broken, I want you to consider Adam and Eve in the garden. They were given a free will to choose to obey God or not. In the Old Testament, we see from Joshua 24, 15, they were able to choose whether they would serve the Lord or not, to serve the Lord or not. And the book of Revelation 22, 17 says that whosoever will, let him take of the water of the life freely. What is the point that I'm trying to bring out? If the seal cannot be broken, the believer no longer has a free will. The believer can no longer choose not to be saved. So how is God a righteous judge if he has to grant someone eternal life that hates him to the core and will cause havoc to the other saints? The next topic is the unpardonable sin. As Red Fox used to say, Elizabeth, it's a big one. I want to quote from Dr. Stanley. In this passage, the term refers to the decoration of the Pharisees who had witnessed undeniable evidence that our Lord was performing miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yet they attribute the miracles to Satan. In the face of irrefutable evidence, they ascribe the work of the Holy Spirit to that of Satan. I agree with a host of biblical scholars that this unique circumstance cannot be duplicated today. End quote. Now, some may think, well, that sounds pretty good, but I'm not buying it. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32 reads as thus. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. If you think about it, the life of Jesus was pretty unique. I mean, there's many things that were unique and simply cannot be duplicated today. I mean, when's the last time you've gone to a wedding and the water was turned to wine? When's the last time you saw a baptism in which once someone came out of the water, lightning was upon them? I don't recall a lot of these things happening today. But there was another unique experience while Jesus was here on earth. There was a ruler of the Jews. His name was Nicodemus. He came to Jesus by night. And Jesus began to expound to him what it meant by being born again. And during that discourse, he said, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But notice that in both cases, the discussion of being born again and the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, Jesus clearly states whosoever. Why do preachers and scholars brush this under the rug when Jesus made it a universal warning? Yes, this was the only time that the Savior walked on the earth. However, when he states whosoever, then it applies not just to those that were with him at that time, but for all time. Whether it's dealing with anger, Matthew 5.22, lust, Matthew 5.28, divorce and remarriage, Matthew 5.32, denying Christ, Matthew 10.33, or the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, if this is one sin that will never be forgiven, then why is this brushed under the rug? So once saved, always saved is proven false by this sin. If this sin only applied to the time that Jesus walked on the earth, he would have said so. The easiest way to look at the sin is this. Those that commit this sin are doing it deliberately. I believe that this passage is connected 
to the Hebrew passage because both are done deliberately. And the insulting of the Holy Ghost is a insult one should not do. If one is an atheist and they say, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, I can assure you that they did not. In order to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, one would have to fully know that the miracles that they were made aware of were done by God. I mean, you can't even convince an, an atheist that there is a God. So how would they know with the full knowing that the miracles were of God? I've heard it been said that if you think that you have committed the unpardonable sin, you haven't. That might be true. The key to understand if someone has gone too far is this. They no longer even have the slightest desire to repent from their wrongdoing. It is possible that those that think that they have gone too far have not. However, if they continue without any repentance at all, they become a prime candidate for it. I believe only God knows for sure who has crossed the line. We should also believe in hope until God says otherwise. What really concerns me is the church today is the body of Christ. Yet many do not believe that the gifts of the Spirit are in operation today. In fact, some have gone so far as to call those who do operate in the gifts of the devil. To me, this is a dangerous practice, and one should be careful that you don't end up attributing to Satan the miracles of God. I understand, and I agree, we should judge and test to make sure they are authentic. However, to lump all gifts, all miracles, to that of the devil is not wise. So, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when a person fully knows what they are doing and they make a conscious decision to treat with disgust, insult, and hatred the work of the Holy Spirit, which could also include the very work of the cross. It is done in such a way that they themselves will permanently separate themselves from the very life of God. Thus they have deliberately passed the point of no return. They cannot come to repentance since they themselves have closed all desire to repent and by an act of their own will are damned. Notice that the Apostle Paul was going down a very dangerous path before his conversion. If the Apostle Paul could do what he did and there was hope for him, how much is it for us today if a member of ISIS were to come to Jesus, God is there to forgive them because God is a merciful God. And if God could save an Apostle Paul, if he can save an ISIS leader, he can save us. Even if after we have been saved and have committed horrible things, God is still there to bring us through. But if one has crossed the line, then there would be no desire at all to change. Now let's look at the three main points that Dr. Stanley brings out in his book. Quote, No sin, no matter how great or frequent, could affect one's salvation. The easiest way to disprove unconditional security is to show a conditional clause to the subject at hand. Consider marriage. If one were to say we can never get a divorce, we can call it unconditional marriage. If one can find a clause that makes marriage conditional, then it would be a mistake to preach unconditional marriage. In Matthew 5.32, we find the clause that makes marriage conditional, which is the cause of fornication. So, there is a clause that proves that marriage is conditional. Now, I want you to follow me on this. It seems like no one has a real problem with that that I've encountered. However, 
There are conditional clauses concerning our salvation. I have already given some, but I want to share another one. It's called deep hatred. In 1 John 3.14, it states, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whosoever does not love abides in death. Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Notice everyone who hates does not have eternal life abiding in them. Thus salvation is conditional. Notice that even the seal of the Holy Spirit could not preserve a murderer. See, this is the contamination that we find on the inside. I will list three of Paul's letters that he writes to Christians. In these letters, he states that those that practice these certain sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. The letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. To the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. And 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. The wicked, we know by default, do not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus made it plain that we must be born again to see and inherit the kingdom of God. Whether an unbeliever practices these sins listed here has no bearing on them being granted eternal life. Unless they are born again, even if they don't do any of these sins, they still don't inherit the kingdom of God. So it would make no sense for the Apostle Paul to warn the unsaved for without being born again, they still go to hell. However, Christians to whom the Apostle Paul is actually writing to are told that they that continually do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Second point, no unbelief after one is saved can affect one's salvation. But here's my question. What is the way we get saved to begin with? Romans chapter 10 verse 9 states that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Since it is the belief and confession that brings us salvation, should it not be the unbelief and denial that severs our salvation? For the scripture states that the just shall live by faith. Think of a Christian who becomes a Jehovah Witness. They would no longer confess that Jesus rose bodily from the dead, but that he rose as a spirit, Michael the archangel. In essence, this would damn a person that once was a Christian to hell and was saved at one time. Notice what Paul wrote to the book of Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. But even if we, this would include the Apostle Paul, who to my knowledge there is no question among anyone that he wasn't saved, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Let him be damned to hell. Verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. Number 3. No conscious decision to walk away can invalidate their salvation. In 2 Peter 2.21, it says, For it would have been better for them, meaning those that were once saved, never to have known the way of righteousness, than after knowing it turned back from the holy command delivered unto them. 
We can all agree that those that never receive God's gift of salvation will unfortunately go to hell. Obviously, children up to a certain age do not count. However, I want you to consider two men that were friends, Sam and John. Sam loved to party and usually would go to bed with a new girl every weekend. He never accepted Jesus and then he died. He went to hell. His friend John would do the same things, but one day he got radically saved. He had a true conversion. He quit running around. He got married. He had three great kids. However, one day later in his life, he met a girl and gave up his wife and moved in with his new girlfriend. A few years later, he died. According to one saved, always saved, he went to heaven. However, the apostle Peter clearly tells us for a Christian, John in this example, would have been better never to have come to Christ than to turn from Christ and go back into the world. So here is my question for the once saved, always saved crowd. How could it be better for a person like John to go to hell for all eternity than to go and be with the Lord for all eternity? If a Christian loses their salvation, then yes, it would have been better for them not to have gotten saved because then they would receive less judgment than the one who did get saved and went back into the world who is held more accountable. Luke chapter 12 verse 47 states, and the servant which knew his Lord's will, that's the one that saved, prepare not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes now let's conclude with the security of the believer as taught in the book of Hebrews I want to tie some things together as we end this study in the book of Hebrews I want to remind those that are listening that I did not go to every single reference to prove conditional security for example the Galatian passage which speaks of falling from grace I left that out in fact, as I pointed out earlier, all one has to do is prove one conditional clause to salvation to prove that once saved, always saved is not scriptural. To me, one of the greatest ways to see that once saved, always saved is not scriptural is to simply look up the word if mentioned in the New Testament, 602 references. If one were to do that, I don't see how they can continue to believe in once saved, always saved. I challenge those that believe in once saved, always saved to do that. How in the world one can still believe that doctrine afterward, I don't understand it. I will cover the two problem texts that are found in the book of Hebrews. But what I'm going to do is bring, is cover some texts before the problem texts in order that we may understand it correctly. Consider it like a doctor that's telling you what you need to change in your life to prevent a fatal occurrence later on. Before I do that, I want you to think of salvation for illustration purposes only like a job. Now, I understand salvation is a free gift. I get that. And by faith, we are saved. However, since Dr. Stanley has asked, at what point can a person lose their salvation? I feel I can at least paint with a broad brush while only God himself could fill in the individual details. So there are certain things that one can do to guarantee to lose your job. I mean, you can get into a fist fight because you don't care for someone at work, that's pretty simple. You're out the door. You don't show up for, let's say, three days. Uh, you're pretty much history. You make too many mistakes. We all make mistakes, but there's a point you'll be shown the door. Or excessive tardiness. So in the kingdom of God, those that live in sin, no longer believe in Jesus and walk away, can lose their salvation. 
However, some people are fired over time, and it's a great area that determines it. God also sees when a believer continues to walk the fence, that one day he's on the other side. So please consider the warning signs that are found in the book of Hebrews, so you don't wind up on the wrong side. To me, I hope this illustration is a help. Think of our walk with God like a rubber band. God is rich in mercy and does not desire any believer to fall from grace. Instead, we need to fall into grace. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. It's important that we stay in him. Thus, there's a great deal of flexibility and mercy that we can tap into. The problem is only God knows at one point the rubber band snaps. Our goal is to tap into his grace and keep close to him. Sad to say, many stretch the rubber band too much too often. Walking in the fear of God is not only safe, but it is wisdom. Before we get into the two problem texts, I briefly want to take a look at some of the other texts in Hebrews in order to understand the problem text. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 states, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. When a person drifts away, they are allowing the things of this world to slowly pull them away from a close relationship with God. It may not be realized right away, and only when one gets into dangerous waters do we finally notice. So each day should be filled with prayer, reading the Bible, worship, and confession of sin. Though a person that is drifting away is saved, it is where it can lead them that is dangerous. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6 But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. We need to keep our roots down deep. We need to throw out the anchor that prevents us from drifting away. Next, the importance of not having a hard heart. And to break all stubbornness which can develop if we continue to allow ourselves to drift and not anchor down. Hebrews 3.8 Do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. The children of Israel are the example that we should learn by. We need to stop being so stubborn and allow God to do what he needs to do in our lives. God was grieved with them, and we are commanded not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 3.10 And I was provoked, oh, so provoked, I said. They never keep their minds on God. They refuse to walk down my road. We need to cut some slack and not be so set in our ways. At this point, the enemy, once he has a foothold in the door of our hearts, he will not stop. It's unfortunate that we can get an attitude that we either don't need others to speak into our lives or have been so hurt that we refuse others to speak into our lives. That is why fellowship with other believers is so important. Do not allow the devil to isolate you, even if others were in the wrong. Consider a fire of many burning coals. If one were to take one out of the fire and set it by itself, soon it would be cold. So we need the fellowship with other believers that act like a set of check and balances in our lives. Otherwise, if we pull away from other believers, we have no one to speak into our lives and thus could fall by the deception of sin. It's not just immorality, anger, gossip that can hurt us spiritually, but discouragement, depression, and unforgiveness. If these are allowed to flourish, it will reap havoc in our lives. 
Notice that once we have drifted away and become unstable, we begin to harden our hearts, which can lead to isolation. Hebrews 3.12 states, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. At this point, our salvation can begin to unravel. Remember, it was our belief and confession that brought us in union with the living God. And so, should it not be unbelief? Unbelief is simply the rewinding us back to our former state of separation from God. Question, can someone be in union with Christ and depart from Him at the same time? That is why we should always have the fear of the Lord. In fact, how in the world does one have the true fear of the Lord if you believe this doctrine? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 states, God's promise of entering His rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Folks, I don't believe for a moment that God is holding a baseball bat and waiting to hit us with it when we fail. But for those of us, we can have a healthy respect for our earthly father. Some will have a healthy respect for our earthly boss. But where is our respect for God Almighty? That is a question that we should be asking ourselves. People sometimes will fear their boss, but can care less about the Lord Jesus. Now that I have listed some verses in Hebrews that show a downward path, it should be easier to understand the problem text. Here's the first one. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once in light and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the word of God to come. First of all, the writer is writing to the Jewish Christians. They have been born again. He goes out of his way and he brings points out to show that they are Christians. They have been enlightened. Well, we are in light because we see things in a new and living way. They have tasted of the heavenly gift that speaks of salvation. Just as Jesus tasted death, it was a real experience. But most important, they are partakers of the Holy Ghost. Only a believer partakes of that. Now, here's the next verse. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Let me read this from the Amplified because I believe it really helps. If they then deviate from the faith and turn away from their allegiance, it is impossible to bring them back to repentance for because while as long as they nail Upon the cross, the Son of God afresh, as far as they are concerned and are holding him up to contempt, shame, and public disgrace. From this translation, we can clearly see what is happening. This was written to the Jews that became Christians. The writer is clearly stating that if they were to turn their back on Christianity and go back to being a Jew, in doing so, remember, it was the Jews that crucified their own Messiah. It is impossible to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and yet at the same time think he deserved to be crucified as a criminal. As long as they now think that Jesus got what he deserved, it was coming to him as a criminal and continue to do so, what they are doing is holding him up to public shame and it would be impossible for them to change their minds or repentance. Why? They cannot be brought back to repentance until their view of Jesus changes from he got what he deserved to he died for me 
because he loved me. So think of repentance as an opening in your heart. How wide you allow the door to be open determines what chance you will repent. That is why the warning signs given before this passage are so important. However, notice the writer after these verses did not give up hope on his audience, but gave encouragement. So this text does not say if you fall away, you cannot repent, but it is a warning because the further you fall away, the harder it is for you to repent. And as long as your mind is in the wrong state, you won't repent. It will be impossible to bring you back to repentance. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 10 says, but which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The writer is speaking of the sacrifice of Jesus and how important it is. It is the only valid sacrifice for our sins. Not only that, but in fact, the high priest never sat down. But Jesus, being our high priest, because his job was done, did sit down. Hebrews 10.12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, remember that phrase, sacrifice for sins, because that will help us unravel the problem text forever sat down on the right hand of God not only the high priest but now all of us male and female can come to God by the blood of Jesus that's found in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 that states having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus we are encouraged by the writer concerning our faith with full assurance and a clear conscience. Verses 21 states, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So just when you think everything is fine, this problem text just seems to smack you in the face. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. And here it is. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. This text is not only an issue for once saved, always saved, but pretty much any Christian. I mean, think of it. Your sins are all forgiven. You deliberately sin, and now you're going to hell. That's not good. But when we first look at it, that's what we seem to think what, it, what the scripture is saying. But notice sin willfully and no more sacrifices for sins. Those two points have a meaning that I'm going to explain. Having a proper understanding will clear things up. Now, if this was 1 Timothy 2, to 12 in many people mine especially men where the apostle paul states i suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over over the man people would be saying oh the bible is clear but in this case when's the last time when someone read that to you as well the bible is clear i guess okay we deliberate sin after we receive the knowledge of truth well to that means, uh, okay, we're, we're done. Every scripture needs to be taken in proper context. You cannot declare something is clear until you have read the entire context on any topic. That's what's important. When you look at this, it says, if we sin willfully, that's something deliberate. Remember I mentioned the Pharisees had done something deliberate. However, Jesus said that all matter of sin shall be forgiven except. So we can take a clue that it's only the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is what there is no forgiveness. So it can't be referring to any sin. 
In fact, here's something else. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a man was sleeping with his stepmother. Now, that was a deliberate, continuous sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth. But we also see that he repents in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 John says that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So how in the world do we untangle this? This is what we're going to do. I want you to consider the full context. Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 26 through 29 is the context in order to understand this. What you want to consider is the first part of verse 26. For if we sin willfully. So that is the act that is the problem. That is the act that is the issue. The question is, what does he mean sin willfully? Obviously, that's deliberate, you would say. But I want you to scroll down to verse 29. You need to scroll down to verse 29. This is so important. And what I want you to do is look at this very closely. The first part of the verse I will mention, and then I'm going to say here is the deliberate sin that the author is referring to. Okay? So I'm reading from the King James. Different translations will say different things. Some will use the word who, some will use the word he. But I think you should be able to get the concept no matter what translation you are using. In verse 29, it says, Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy. Now here is the deliberate sin that is being spoken of in the book of Hebrews that has the connection with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, okay? Who has trodden under foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite or to insult unto the Spirit of grace. What I want to do is paraphrase to kind of help you really understand this and get this deep inside of you. In verse 26, where it states, if we sin willfully, if we do this deliberately. Now remember, Jesus said all sin will be forgiven except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, let us understand that when the Pharisees were attributing the miracles of God to Satan, they were calling Jesus Bezelzebub, the prince of the devils. Remember that. Because they believed or because they confessed deliberately that they would look at Jesus and call him the prince of the devils, that kind of hatred, we see this in the book of Hebrews, and this is how. Remember, the Pharisees did not accept, with a few exceptions, did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, but they had him crucified. And thus, because they could not accept Jesus casting out devils by the Spirit of God, Neither do they accept the work that he did on the cross as a work of God. So this is the connection when we go to the book of Hebrews. Because what happens is in the book of Hebrews, the author is clearly showing that his audience have a true experience that they know without a shadow of a doubt what Jesus has done in their life. So let me paraphrase 
what I believe is going on here. If we, I don't care if you're Jew, you're a Gentile, it doesn't matter. When you have really tasted and had a real conversion and knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is, you come to the understanding that his sacrifice that he did at the cross is the only sacrifice for sins, period. Once you take away that sacrifice, there's no other way to get to the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It is the only valid way in which we get our sins forgiven. Here's the point I want to bring out. When somebody receives Jesus in their heart, people sometimes will then fall away. That's not what this verse is talking about. What this verse is talking about is those that truly receive Jesus and then deliberately knowing that Jesus is the only valid sacrifice for sins and the blood that he shed and the torture that he went through for us, they begin to mock. They begin to insult the very work that he did and they begin to be the great mocking enemy against the very one that sanctified them. That's the danger point that's being brought out here. And that is why, as the scripture goes on, under the law of Moses, a person died without mercy if there were two or three witnesses. However, we are not speaking of Moses, but God himself who came in human flesh. This is Jesus, the Yeshua, the Son of God. If under Moses you thought it was tough, look at how it is with the Son of God. Notice the fate of those that did attribute the miracles of Jesus to Satan. It's not just insulting the Son of God, but to attribute the work of the cross to be worthless and to think Jesus as meaningless after you have been saved is the path that could lead to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What that means is when a person does that, they begin to go toward a path that they cannot come back with. If you continue to count the blood of Jesus as unholy and unclean and worthless and meaningless, it can lead you to a place that your heart will be damned. And the reason why your heart will be damned is you are literally breaking yourself off as a branch from the very life of God. When you separate yourself from the life of God, you will wither and die. When you close all the doors to any type of repentance or desire, you become in danger of separating yourself. In essence, you become in such a way you are actually beginning to enter into a second death even though you're not in hell because death is simply a separation and people that do this are separating themselves from the life of God notice that in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 30 and 31 for we know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Right after he states the Lord shall judge his people, the next verse is the final blow to one saved, always saved. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Folks, if you simply follow God, keep your heart soft, teachable, confess your sins, you'll be fine. If we sin, we tap into his grace. God wants us to make it. The question is, do we? Folks, this stuff is serious. 
This particular sin in Hebrews is serious. There are warning signs that go there. If you accidentally insult the spirit of grace, that's one thing. But if you deliberately, with hatred and insult, curse and insult with venom the very one that sets you free, then you are going down a path that can lead you to the point of no return. And then that's why the scripture says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I don't believe for a moment that Dr. Stanley is not a man of God. I believe he is a man of God. He has brought thousands to Christ. He has a real heart for people. And maybe because of that heart, he wants to believe this so bad in order to comfort people that have lost some loved ones. But remember, we don't want to treat God with disrespect. It's not once saved, then God is optional. God needs to be part of our life every day. That's what we need to get from this message. And I end with the poem. At the beginning and even today, fellowship with God is according to his way. Salvation was given after man's sin to deal with the virus that resides within. There is something that we must do to receive salvation. It depends on you. Sin can affect us, so do not be deceived or be tricked by men like the serpent tricked Eve. For every branch is in danger when unbelief sets in, it severs ties and one's fellowship with him. For we have been given our precious free will, whom God will not violate, yet one thought still. If a stranger came to your door, and asked to come in, would you agree to do so no matter where he's been? So is it a wise to assume no matter how one behaves, God must adhere to when saved, always saved. And in conclusion, if you have any questions, please leave a comment. For not only the Matthew passage, but the Hebrew passage, you have to be pretty bad to go down that path. And I believe there's hope, even for those that think they have. But when there is no desire left, you cut out the very life of God that wants to bring you back. The best thing that we can do for people that have a hard heart is to pray that God will give them a heart of repentance. As long as there's a possibility, we should believe in hope. But there comes a time that some people choose to die even though they are physically alive.